Good morning. Welcome to our study this morning. This is our continuation of our study on conscience morality and the spiritual life. We're going to uh, look at lessons 31 and 32 today. It's entitled The Hams and the Dysfunctional Strategies. Uh, for those who might be new, the hams are the happiness attainment motivators of the human life that we receive from Adam by genetics. And uh, we'll begin our study with a moment of silent prayer, the opportunity, if necessary, to use, utilize 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you need to do so, you may do the, so now. Let us pray. Father, as we study this hour, we ask for the Spirit's insight into these things so that we might see how they relate to us and our uh, happiness strategies as opposed to our spiritual joy that you have provided for us in our reservoir of righteousness. We ask also that we might be able to see it in other people so that we might be able to relate to them in ways that the Spirit can show us how they can receive the message of the, of the Spirit, the message of the Gospel, uh, for their own lives so that we might minister to them or offer them salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. As we look this hour on the uh, conscience, morality, and spiritual life lessons 31 and 32, uh, we're going to look at the uh, Diagnostic and St Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which I call the Dysfunctional Strategies Manual. Okay? You can look at that DSM as the Dysfunctional Strategies Manual, as we talked about last time, and we'll see that again in a slide coming up. Last week we introduced the DSM personality disorders. This week we'll, we'll review them and uh, add some comments, and then we'll categorize each of the tactics that we found in them last time and review this time according to the happiness attainment motivators, and this is going to be a group participation project so that you all get to, uh, get to participate because participatory learning is a wonderful thing and uh, you all can display your uh, acumen at the subject and, <laughs> and uh, uh, shine in, uh, in your uh, bright light of, uh, of what you know about uh, the happiness attainment motivators. So I think you'll find it an interesting uh, project and, and uh, one that we'll enjoy. Uh, first we're going to uh, look at some comments from a uh, psychiatrist, uh, George Borey, uh, on personality disorders. And then uh, we'll actually intersperse a few of his comments in among the, uh, the different descriptions of the personality disorders. He says this, a personality disorder consists of inflexible and maladaptive personality traits which interfere with day-to-day -day functioning and may involve subjective unhappiness. Unhappiness. There are several general criteria. Behaviors that differ from cultural expectations in more than just one of the following areas. Cognition, emotion, social functioning, and impulse control. <coughs> now, some of these things are beyond the realm of the happiness attainment motivators. Uh, some cognition is a mental, uh, mental functional, biological, a neuroanatomical issue, and uh, so is not, does not fall in. And, and we might see a little bit of that when we do our analysis of all of the different uh, descriptors of these different personality disorders. Uh, carrying on with, uh, with Dr. Bore, uh, problems that are spread across a broad range of situations, significant problems in social or work life, problems that are relatively stable and date back at least to adolescence or early adulthood, personality disorders are great examples of how mental illness is usually a matter of degree rather than an either-or situation. And I have underlined that uh, because I want you to get the idea here that this is a continuum that we have 
uh, in, our, in our happiness attainment motivator strategies, the, the chemical, religious, approbation, materialism, power, or sexual strategies that humans have as the basis of trying to make themselves happy. Notice from the previous slide that there is a, a subjective unhappiness associated with these personality disorders because they are dysfunctional strategy. It is a dysfunctional strategy for happiness. We have, and we'll see the slide coming up, human good strategy, a human bad strategy, and then the dysfunctional strategies that you wonder how in the world can a person think that this is going to make them happy. Well, in some cases, it's just a rejection of the attempt to be happy. They have just rejected. They have failed, and so they reject everything about uh, the, uh, the, the choices that they have to, uh, to be happy. Uh, but it is, a, it is a continuum. It's not an either or. It's a matter of degree. And what you're going to find as we go through these is that you, in certain situations, have some of these. But uh, you're not, uh, you don't have a personality disorder because they're not a stable across many aspects of your life uh, kind of, uh, of, of stra or tactics in your life. They are occasional and in different situations and at different times. And uh, our objective is to recognize them so that we can tell we are not walking by means of the spirit, but by means of the flesh. So that we can understand our, our humanness better, so that we can more appropriately walk in our spiritual nature. Okay? Dr. Bore goes on. At what point, for example, do you go from saying someone is creative to saying they are eccentric to saying they are crazy? The line is really impossible to draw. And that's the end of, uh, of Dr. Bore's comments. I might add, at what point do the morality or immorality strategies of the happiness attainment motivators become dysfunctional? There is a point at which those strategies become dysfunctional. We're going to look at, the dis we're going to look at them in a backwards manner. We're going to look at dysfunction first. Uh, then we may look at the sinful side and then look at the human good side last. Uh, I haven't quite decided where we're going after the dysfunctional. I'm working on, on both areas, uh, the sinful and the, the, the immoral and the moral, the uh, sinful and the human good aspects, and I haven't quite decided where we're going to go with it next week. But first we're going to look at the dysfunctional. Because I think if you can see the dysfunctional, it'll be easy to see the, uh, the other aspects as well. Okay, so here's a ham, a happiness attainment motivator. Uh, could be any one of the six, and it has good strategies, a good strategy, it has a bad strategy, and it has a dysfunctional dis-strategy, I guess you would call it, and it's all involved with the six hams, the chemical, religious, approbation, materialism, power, or sexual happiness motivators. <coughs> Every one of these strategies has their own tactics. There's a, there are tactics for the good, and we'll look at those. There are tactics for the bad. We'll look at those. There are the dysfunctional tactics, and that's what we're looking at today. The good strategy is the moral approach to life. Attempting to be happy by suppressing the immoral urges and choosing the culturally approved options for each of the hams. Note that this has an element of approbation already built into it. You see, they... I don't know how this is going to work because I don't know that I actually recalibrated this. But they are looking for the culturally approved options. Okay? Because morality is a great bit cultural. What is moral in our country, in our culture, is different from what's moral in another culture. Now, they basically are the same, and, and we're all born with those six, those six areas of strategies, but there are variations uh, based on the culture in which we live and, and the uh, upbringing that you've had. Part of it's genetic, 
part of it is environmental. And so uh, these, these strategy, uh, the, the tactics are, uh, are based on what's cult culturally accepted as being good. Right? I love air quotes. Right? Good. Uh, because of that, there's an approbation built in. Now, and the reason I point that out to you is because approbation, you're going to see throughout the dysfunctional strategies, you're going to see approbation as a dominant, a, a dominant element in all of them. The bad strategy is the immoral approach to life. Choosing those things that bring immediate pleasure to the desires of the body, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. With disrespect or even disdain, for the standards of the culture or of the God who created them. The dysfunction strategy is really a failure strategy. A failure to be able to cope with the ham decision making process and to fall into all manner of inappropriate decisions, many of which we'll look at today. Now let's look at the Christian life uh, a little bit. We're just going to look at uh, the descriptors of uh, what it is rather than getting into the strategies and tactics of the Christian life. Uh, but it is the Christian life that's our alternative to the ham lifestyle. You have to get this, that it is an alternative. Okay. Christianity is not choosing the good. Christianity is not choosing the good over the bad. Right? It is an alternative to the good. This, the hams are a continuum strategy, none of which is the reservoir of righteousness. None of which is our spiritual birthright, our spiritual nature. None of which are. You cannot be a good Christian by being a good human. You have to be a good Christian by being a spiritual Christian, then you're automatically good, intrinsically good, agathos good, the good that comes from God's very nature that resides in us. It's not choosing the good over the bad. Okay? That doesn't make you a good Christian. It makes you a good human being, and it gives you a big truckload of wood, hay, and stubble for the judgment seat of Christ. But it does not make you a good Christian. It will not give you joy. The Christian life is righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, God's righteousness, leads to peace. Peace, God's peace, leads to joy. Far better than human happiness. Far better than human happiness. Human happiness cannot touch this because human joy is the same under every circumstance. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Right? So is his happiness. It does not depend on your circumstances. It does not depend on how things are going. When, when your happiness depends on how things are going, you're not living in the reservoir of righteousness. You're living in your hams. You're living in your hands. There's no way around it. We fail at that all the time. And we need to recognize that because we don't always recognize the sin, the particular sin or sins that go along with what we're doing, the way we're living, the way we're responding to life. And if we don't recognize those sins, we need to at least recognize the hams, the happiness atten att attainment motivators in what we're doing. Is this a good thing that I'm doing or is this a spiritual thing that I'm doing? Okay. Because there is a major difference. You're not going, you're not going to uh, get anywhere by functioning in the hams in your spiritual life. Hams will be found out at the judgment seat of Christ. Is that where you want them to be found out or do you want to find out about them now 
and eliminate it so that you don't have to stand there when those dump trucks back up and dump all the wood, hay, and stubble out. I don't want to be there when all the wood, hay, and stubble is dumped out. Okay? I don't want that to be me. I want to find out about them now so that when I'm there, the trucks that back up will have the gold, silver, and precious stones, not the wood, hay, and stubble. Bonfires get hot. Bonfires get hot, and we don't want to see a big bonfire of your human good thinking in you throughout your life that you have been a good Christian and being proud of that fact. In fact, the being the proud of it is a good indicator that you're not living it, okay? So let's look at this alternative lifestyle. Oh, boy, that was a bad thing to say. Alternative to the ham lifestyle. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in the Messiah Yeshua who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Well, let's divide that into half. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in the Messiah Yeshua. Hooray! Isn't that great? Except there's a qualifier, right? Is there condemnation in those who are in the Messiah Yeshua? Yeah, if you don't fulfill the second half of the verse, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. But fortunately we have 1 John, which says if our heart condemn us, we have an advocate uh, in the, uh, with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, the sins are not going to bring you down. But the human good is going to bring you down. Jesus Christ rejected human good at the cross. He died to the sinful nature. He died for our sins. Right? They're paid for. Never an issue again in our lives. Other than a relationship, uh, I mean a fellowship issue with the Father. If we have sins in our, in our life, then it breaks that fellowship. But guess what else does? Human good. Morality breaks the fellowship with the Father. Morality breaks the fellowship with the Father too. Only what the Father does is what Jesus did, right? That's what we should be. He is the author and perfecter of our doctrine, of our faith, of our daily living life. That's what we should do. Only what we see the Father doing. Not what we think is a good thing. What is culturally acceptable, approved goodness in our in our am nature. Okay, so we have to walk according to the spirit, not the flesh. Hams are the flesh. Good or bad, they are the flesh. Here's another promise to those who do uh, walk in the spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill, fulfill the lust. And the lust is the motivators, the motivators of the flesh. It's a beautiful promise. We need only to walk in the Spirit and we will not obey or fulfill the temptations and desires that our flesh motivates in us to find human happiness. Human happiness. Everybody wants human happiness. Except the believer who is aware that there is a better alternative lifestyle. The spiritual lifestyle. Ephesians 2.2 2. Wherein in past time you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. See, the children of disobedience. They failed to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have disobeyed the command, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Among whom also we had, we all had, our conversation, our manner of living, conversation is Old English, for our manner of life, in times past, in the lusts, desires, motivators of our flesh, fulfilling the lust, desires, motivators of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Good description of how we did walk and how we can still walk. 1 Peter 4, 1, therefore, since the Messiah suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts, desires, motivators of men, but for the will of Yahweh. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, that's the unbeliever, when we walked in lewdness, sexual motivation, lust, chemical, uh, and uh, there's also chemical, there's also sexual in there. Drunkenness, that's chemical. Revelries, that's a combination of chemical and uh, sexual. Drinking parties, that's of course uh, chemical. And abominable idolatries, that's religious. Okay? When we lived in those. O wretched man that I am, Romans 7.24 begins, who will deliver me from this body of death? Where does the sin nature reside? In the body. What are you going to leave behind when you go to heaven? That's right. And that's why you're going to leave it behind because you can't take the sinful nature with you. I thank Yahweh through Yeshua the Messiah, our master. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of Yahweh, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation, in 8.1, we're going to jump ahead to 8.1, to those who are in the Messiah who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, that's the law of Yahweh, the law of the Spirit of life, in the Messiah Yeshua has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now what's the law of sin and death? The Mosaic law. And for application any set of rules for Christian living, except mine. Huh? Any set of rules for Christian living. Doesn't matter where, it, it, Christian rules for, for spirits for Christian living, uh, church rules, I should say, for uh, spiritual living, uh, vary from, from region of the country and area of the world. Because you'll have rules in some areas that you're not to associate with certain people that you don't have in other areas. Right. Um, you'll have certain dress codes in some areas that you won't have in other areas. And all of those are human, good, happiness, attainment, motivator, satisfying rules set up by man for man. Trying to make the Christian a good human being so that they will think that they're a good Christian and be happy. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. For the law of the spirit of life in the Messiah Yeshua has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Why doesn't the law work? It's weak through the flesh. It's weak through the sinful nature. Okay? We'll see that as we look at these various tactics, dysfunctional tactics of the happiness attainment motivators. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, Yahweh did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned it. Don't walk in it. It's already been condemned. He's paid for some of it, the sins part. He rejected the rest of it, the human good part. That the righteousness or that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, you can't do it by being good. You have to walk by means of the spirit. No rules. Doesn't say uh, those fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but who walk according to the following set of, of rules. No. Walk according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Human good, human bad, dysfunction. That's what your mind is set upon. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally, that's fleshly minded, is death. You're out of fellowship with God. Operational death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the flesh controlled mind is enmity against God, against Yahweh, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. 
cannot be subject to the law of God. Okay? Now, is the, can the law of God be the law of sin and death? No. No. But the flesh is subject to the law of sin and death. What is subject to the law of Yahweh? The mindset on the spiritual is, is in accord with the law of God. Titus 3.3 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, <coughs> desires, motivators, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's pretty bad, uh, pretty bad rap on people, isn't it? But when the kindness and the love of Elohim our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Okay? Immediately this tells you that the issue is works of righteousness. It's not about sins. It's about our human good. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Yeshua, the Messiah, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the expectation of eternal life. We'll look at this verse in great detail in an upcoming study because there's a, about two weeks of information in this one verse here. So we'll look at it later. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Why? Because it is the fruit of the Spirit. Can't be any law against what God does because God is perfect. So there can't be anything wrong with this. There is no human bad side, or let's put it this way, there is no spiritual bad side to the fruit of the Spirit, like there is a human bad side to the human good. So there's no law against it. No law against it. Against such there is no law. And those who are the Messiahs have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You have done that. When you believed in him, your flesh was crucified. Now you have to reckon it to be true. You have to account it to be true. You have to count on the fact that it is. You have to reject it as if it's dead. You're not going to pick up a dead body and drag it around with you everywhere you go, right? Well, that's what you're supposed to do with this. The sinful nature has been crucified. It's dead. Don't pick it up and drag it around with you. Don't carry it with you. Okay? If we live... By the Spirit, that's what's really the what's proper translation here. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I mean, what's your life? Your life is the Spirit. The Spirit has given you new life. So if we live by that Spirit, we should walk in that Spirit. Makes sense. This is your walk. Love, joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's our walk. Now, what prevents you from walking by means of the Spirit? Cramps. You get leg cramps when you walk in the flesh, and it takes you out of the walk in the Spirit. This is, there is a hindrance to your walk. They are the hams, the happiness attainment motivators, and they produce cramps to stop you in your spiritual walk. Every time you revert to human morality as your response to life, you get a cramp in your spiritual walk. And that's the end of it. Then you have to sit down. You have to sit out. You have to, get, you have to stop and get rid of the cramp. Right? So that's our job is cramp diagnosis. We've got to learn how to diagnose cramps and get rid of them. The human happiness attainment motivators are six basic strategies known by the acronym CRAMPS. They are chemical happiness motivation. That's one of the desires of the flesh. Remember these things, uh, because everything in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. 
culturally established, okay? Culturally defined. Chemical happiness motivation is a desire of the, of the flesh, of the body. Okay? Not flesh in terms of sinful nature, but flesh in terms of the body. Your body wants certain things. Okay? Sometimes you're, you can really tell what your body wants. Sometimes you'll go driving late at night to go get something that your body wants because it wants it so bad. And, and your body has desires. It has things that it needs. And they are typically chemical and sexual. Those are the two primary areas of the desires of the flesh. Then we have religious happiness motivation. That's a pride of life. That's a pride of life issue. Approbation is also a pride of life issue. Materialism is a pride of the eyes, the things that you can see, the outward visible expressions of, of uh, uh, wealth and, and uh, uh, happiness through contentment with what you have. Materialism ranges all the way from uh, desiring extravagance, uh, wanting to win the lottery so you can, you can own uh, Maseratis and Bugattis and and mansions on the beach and all of those things all the way down to just enough just having everything I need right? those are all the the uh, the range of materialism that we have power happiness motivation is also a pride of life issue and sexual happiness motivation is the desire of the flesh desire of the body a body bodily make my body happy okay Give me chemicals, give me sex, the body's happy. That's, that's, all it, that's basically what it thinks about. Each of the strategies have three, uh, I'm sorry, each of the hams have three basic strategies. Human good, morality, human bad, sins or immorality, and the failure strategy called dysfunction, which uh, we know as mental illness or personality disorders. We'll first look at the failure strategies, the desperation approach, to attaining human happiness. Psychologists and psychiatrists have divided them into three broad categories based more on overall similarities than on our understanding of their causes because there is no understanding of their causes right, among psychiatrists and psychologists. I, however, have the answer. They are failure strategies of the human happiness attainment motivators. And you'll see that as we go through and identify each of them, you'll be able to see how that works and be able to say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I see that. All right, so uh, remember from our video that we watched last time, this is all, all of these are just uh, determined to be diseases and disorders by vote of the committee who decided, okay, yeah, let's put all those together and we'll call that a disorder and then we can treat it and get paid for it. Right. Cluster A, people who appear odd or eccentric. Paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. Cluster B are the highly egocentric people who may appear dramatic, emotional, or erratic. That's the antisocial personality disorder, the borderline personality disorder, the histrionic personality disorder, and the narcissistic personality disorder. And then cluster C, people who appear anxious or fearful, the avoidant personality disorder, the dependent personality disorder, and the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So let's first look at the paranoid personality disorder. We looked at these last time. We're going to look at them again. Uh, we're going to uh, just give a little comment, but what I want you to be looking for this time as you go through them, first time you just had to basically become acquainted with these. Now I want you to look at them and think of them in terms of the hams and failure. Okay, the hams and failure. How are they? And then next hour we're actually going to go through every one of these, and you're going to tell me what the failure is, and what the and what the ham is that it's a failure related to. Okay. So pay close attention. We will be grading, and I don't use a curve. All right. A, per a pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of others such that their motives are, as, are interpreted as malevolent. These people um, uh, build walls around them because everybody is 
malevolently inclined against them. Okay? They, uh, this person suspects without sufficient basis that others are exploiting, harming, or deceiving him or her. They are preoccupied with unjustified doubts about the loyalty or trustworthiness of friends or associates. They uh, oftentimes feel they were betrayed as a child. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're hostile because of it. Uh, they're reluctant to confide in others because of unwarranted fear that the information will be used maliciously against him or her. They read hidden meaning or threatening meanings into benign remarks or events. I'll give you some other uh, characteristics. They, are, they have suspiciousness, distrust, guardedness, grudges, hostility, and, and, they, and, and covert vengefulness. Their common defenses are projection, projective identification, denial, reaction formation. We'll go into those another time when we get into the different defense mechanisms. Um, they, they, they feel that others are dangerous, a danger to them. Okay? Uh, individuals with, uh, okay, they also uh, perceive attacks on his or her character or reputation that are not apparent to others and are quick to react angrily or to counterattack. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many have you done that? How many of you have done that in the past? You have perceived attack, an attack on your character or reputation that's not apparent to other people, and you've reacted angrily or counterattacked. All of you who are married, raise your hand. All of you who have parents, raise your hand. All of you who have children, raise your hand. Okay? If you fall into one of those categories, you have done this. If you can't recognize that you have done this, you need this study. You need this study because we all do this at times. Well, has recurrent suspicions without justification regarding the fidelity of a spouse or a sexual partner. All of these things people do without having a paranoid personality disorder. It's the far end of the continuum that makes it a personality disorder. Otherwise, it's just dysfunction of your happiness attainment motivator strategy. Okay? You didn't choose the good, and you chose some kind of bad. Let's take number six. You perceived that someone was attacking your, your uh, character, and you reacted to it uh, angrily. It's just a simple sin, right? A uh, you were angry and you sinned. All right? So, we all do that kind of thing. It's just it's not pervasive. Now, if you fall into a pattern of your doing it, what does it tell you? That you're starting to go into dysfunction. That you're not just sinning, you're starting to go into dysfunction. And, and I think that this really defines reversionism, backsliding. That a person who is backsliding is going to develop a pattern of these that is pervasive. They're going to keep going and going and going until they end up with a personality disorder or mental illness. Individuals with this personality disorder distrust others and are suspicious of their motives. Bore says about these people, these are among the most unpleasant people in the world. Every remark you make is exhaustively analyzed for hidden meanings. Everything you do is interpreted in the worst possible light. Every, uh, everyone is believed to have an agenda, an angle. Yeah. They are easily distinguished, distinguished from the paranoid schizophrenic, however. They do not suffer from auditory hallucinations. They don't hear voices and their beliefs are well within the realm of possible reality. There are no CIA agents or space aliens involved. Only all kinds of people that want my job, my wife, my money, my things, huh? my reputation. Note that paranoia is much more common in societies 
that place a great deal of value on your position in the society and in which everyone is basically interested in themselves and no one else. Despite our lip service to equality and caring for each other, our society leans in that direction. There are few societies that are so competitive and individualistic that paranoia is not only normal but valued. In some, in some business circles, paranoia is a way of life. In some high finance areas, you have to be paranoid like this to make it. It's a valuable commodity. The schizoid personality disorder. Individuals with this cluster A personality disorder express only a limited range of emotion in social interactions in form of few, if any, close relationships with others. This is a, uh, uh, not a, not schizophrenia, right? it's a schizoid, and it, it basically schizoid, schism, uh, it's a split with the world, they, they don't relate well to the world. They have a pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of expression of emotions in interpersonal settings. They, uh, they neither desire nor enjoy close relationships, including being part of a family. These are the black sheep of the family in some cases, or people who do not associate with their family. And you'll meet people that they haven't seen their family. I saw, met somebody not too long ago, they hadn't seen his brother in 11 years. And they live in the same town. Hadn't seen his brother for 11 years, they live in the same town. Now one or the other of them probably has a little schizoid personality tendency. Okay? They, they just don't want to be in those relationships. Uh, they almost always choose solitary activities. They're not going to be on the softball team, on the bowling, team, they're not going to be doing those kind of things, they're going to do solitary activities where they can just be by themselves and do it. They have little if any interest in having sexual experiences with another person. They take pleasure in few if any activities. They rather just do nothing. They lack close friends or confidants other than first degree relatives. They appear indifferent to the praise or criticism of others. They show emotional coldness detachment or flattened affectivity. No emotion. They don't show any emotion. Bore says about them, schizoid means split off. In this case, split off from society. These are the loners of the world. Emotionally cold, they don't have uh, friends or family, and they are quite content with that situation. It is possible that these are people with some form of high-functioning autism, perhaps Asperger's syndrome. The self-absorption of these people suggests that there is some dissociation or depersonalization involved as well. It is more common in stigmatized groups such as the poor or minorities or people who think that they're stigmatized in one way or another. The schizotypal personality disorder, to them, uh, they, uh, life is like a crazy quilt. Everything is disoriented and everything is off. And this, uh, this type of disorder, the schizotypal disorder, makes up 50% of the homeless people. 50% of the homeless people have this disorder. Okay. It's a pervasive pattern of social and interpersonal deficits marked by acute discomfort with and reduced capacity for close relationships, as well as by cognitive or perceptual distortions and eccentricities of behavior. That's why you see those people. See those homeless people doing weird eccentric things? That's because they have uh, this disorder. Ideas of reference. Ideas of reference involve the belief that casual events, people's remarks, things like that, are referring to me when in fact they are not. Everything's about me. Okay? They are self-absorbed that way. Everything's about me and it's not good. They have odd beliefs or magical thinking that influences their behavior and it's inconsistent with the subcultural norms. They have superstitions, uh, they believe in clairvoyance, telepathy, sixth sense. Uh, in children and adolescents they have bizarre fantasies or preoccupations. <coughs> they have unusual perceptual experiences including bodily illusions. They, they think that they fly, that they, that they float, that they do things like that. 
They have odd thinking and speech, vague, circumstantial, metaphorical, over-elaborate or stereotyped speech. They have suspiciousness or a, por a paranoid ideation. They have, they're, they're somewhat like the paranoid. Uh, they have inappropriate or constricted affect, emotional display. Uh, the behavior or appearance that is odd, eccentric, or peculiar. Right? They like to be different. The lack of close friends or confidants other than the first degree relatives. Excessive social anxiety that, that does not diminish with familiarity. No matter how long you know these people, they still don't, they, they still have, they're still nervous about being with you. Huh? You know people like that. Um, and they tend to be associated with paranoid fears rather than negative judgments about self. Now they may get along fine and tolerate you, but at the first sign of anything, they, you know, they, they, they get upset, they reject you, you don't hear from them again uh, for a long period of time. Even if they, you know, if you've been really helpful to them, they, they'll just kind of abandon you because they're a little bit afraid of what might happen. Let's see if I have some other notes on them. Um, they uh, have uh, alcohol abuse problems or drug abuse problems quite often. Um, what others say is of little importance or interest to them. Uh, displays of emotion are unnecessary and embarrassing. I am my own best friend. Uh, stay calm. Got to try to stay calm. There are a few reasons to be close to people. They withdraw and they intellectualize. Uh, the social world is engulfing to them. Just too much. It's too much. I got to. I got to stay away. It's too. It's too much for me to handle. Boré says about them, where do you draw the line between someone who is merely eccentric and someone who has something as horrible sounding as schizotypal personality disorder? Many people believe in telepathy. Many have odd bodily illusions. And most people are superstitious to one degree or another. It's only when you add a little paranoia, a degree of social isolation, some social anxiety, that a psychologist can begin to feel more confident in making this diagnosis. Perhaps in the schizotypal we are looking at a combination of slight psychotic tendencies mixed with social anxiety and or Asperger's syndrome. Antisocial personality disorder. This is uh, this is the uh, about 80 percent of all prisoners in prison have this 80 percent. There is a perver pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. Failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Fighting, stealing, deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Irritability and aggressiveness as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Reckless disregard for the safety of self or others. Consistent irresponsibility as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or honor financial obligations. A lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent to or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. In other words, you have Congress. Boré says, it is believed that something on the order of one in six people, mostly men, have this personality disorder. Uh, he thinks it's uh, likely to be higher, perhaps as high as 20%. The antisocial disorder used to be called sociopath, and therefore, uh, before that, the psychopath. The change in name simply reflects the fact that the public tends to associate the disorder only with the most extreme and dramatic cases such as serial killers. But in fact, people with little sense of empathy or guilt live all around us and we hardly notice them until they affect us personally. If they have a decent level of intelligence, they fully recognize that certain acts are illegal or looked down upon by others and, and since that only makes trouble for themselves, they avoid those things. In other words, most antisocials are rational. And 
members of Congress. Right? It's illegal, isn't they? But they can get around that. You know, it a disregard. A lot of things in there that you can see. I believe that, okay, this is Boré again, I believe that in addition to the violent criminals that may be obviously antisocial, there are also many highly successful antisocials who in fact owe their success to the very fact that they don't really care how they get wealth and power, only that they do actually get it. I have strong suspicions about some of those corporate executives who blithely steal from their employees and stockholders and calmly lie about it when they get caught. I also suspect that some of our politicians are sociopaths, especially those that seem to be able to ignore the suffering of the less fortunate while filling their pockets and the pockets of their friends with money, or those who have no qualms about declaring wars that kill and maim thousands of our own young men and women, as well as hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women, and children of the so-called enemy. So you can see his political, his political uh, leanings there. No one knows exactly where the antisocial personality disorder comes from, but we do know that many violent criminals have damage to the prefrontal lobes. Apparently, the prefrontal lobes play a big part in controlling the limbic system, including damping emotions. In some circumstances, the fear response of the amygdala is dampened, while the rage response is intensified. If you are very angry but afraid of nothing, you can do a great deal of damage. Of course, the majority of antisocials have not had damage to the prefrontal lobes, and so we can only speculate that perhaps these areas are less well-developed than they are in normal people. Others view antisocial personality disorder as derived from poor upbringing involving abuse or neglect. In particular, some believe that it is the result of a lack of love, especially from the mother, which prevents the child from developing the ability to love or even the ability to recognize the personhood of others. As with most psychological disorders, it is quite likely that both the physical and the developmental explanations play a part. There are, there are genetic and cultural aspects. One unfortunate aspect of the disorder is that there seems to be no therapy that can touch it. These people are excellent liars and manipulators, quite capable of convincing their therapists and others that they have reformed, found Jesus, or otherwise bettered themselves. Many go on to form inspirational groups and write self-help manuals, but it's really just that they found another way to use people. <coughs> Next hour we'll pick up with borderline personality disorder. And uh, before we uh, end the, the sociopathic, we'll look at the, uh, a few examples. Uh, they, uh, their common defense is omnipotent control. Others are selfish, manipulative, and not worthy of respect. Um, rules are meant for others. Only fools follow all the rules. Rules are meant to be broken. Look out for number one. My pleasure comes first. If others are hurt, offended, or inconvenienced by my behavior, that's their problem. Do it now. I will not allow myself to be frustrated. I will do whatever I must to get whatever I want. I am really smarter than most everyone else. They deserve to be taken because they're not as smart as I am. And if they were as smart as me, they'd be acting like this and they could have what they wanted and I wouldn't be able to take it away from them. Their, their people are to be used. People are to be used to gain what you want. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, take a 10-minute break and get back, well, maybe a little bit longer than a 10-minute break. We'll try to get back uh, close to 10 after, between 5 and 10 after. Father, we're grateful for this hour. We're grateful that you have given us an alternative to the happiness attainment motivator lifestyle, that you have given us a spiritual lifestyle, a lifestyle of righteousness, peace, and joy, so that we might enjoy uh, tranquility under any circumstance, and in the presence of anybody in our periphery. We thank you that you have given this to us. We ask you to show us how we can activate it by rejecting the happiness motivators in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name.